Before we get to the main content for today's episode, you guys have I'm just insulted that I'm not the main content, but fine. Oh, you're always you're always the main content in my heart, Adrian. But uh, more importantly, you guys have just released a new report at Infrastructure Partners Australia, haven't you? I've had a busy few weeks actually. We released three new reports. Oh wow! Uh, one on um, investment budget monitor, uh, so that looks at. Um, all the different investments the states are making, puts them in a league table. Uh, we did an investor survey, uh, which is uh, global investors and in infrastructure. But I think the one you're talking about is a piece of work on road user charging and specifically around electric vehicles. Uh, that is the one I was referring to. Uh, can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, so yeah, we, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia, along with a lot of other bodies like the Productivity Commission, Infrastructure Australia, the Harper Review, Infrastructure Victoria, lots of others have spoken about uh, having a road user charge, a rational approach to the way we charge for road use. So right now people pay fuel excise at the pump um, and notionally that is, is towards the consumption of roads. But as cars have got more fuel efficient over time, um, they use less petrol for the kilometres they travel or less diesel for the kilometres they travel and therefore not as much is raised um, in terms of revenue through fuel excise and the kind of effective cost per kilometre has gone down. Um, and that's about to accelerate very quickly with um, electric vehicle uptake uh, and the future of light transport is electric we think there's this uh, kind of once in a generation opportunity that's open for the next couple of years to uh, change the way we charge for roads at the thin end of that technology wedge uh, by applying a distance-based charge equivalent to fuel excise to electric vehicles it's a bit of a change though isn't it from because uh, this isn't the first report that infrastructure partnerships australia has released on the topic and previously you've called for I think uh, mass, distance, location, and time to be components of the the road user charge. This is a bit of a departure from that. Um, can you explain the change? Yeah. So I think over the last ten years, IPA has kind of been leading this policy debate around road user charging, and there's been a lot of focus on what what's the right idea, what's the right outcome uh, in the end game, what's the the economically perfect solution, um, which. It is generally considered to be a mass distance location based charge. So that is you would get charged a differential rate based on how heavy a vehicle is, where it's traveling and at, and at what time. Uh, I think that um, that is the sort of the, the end game, but there's also a reality that big reforms happen incrementally um, and you have to seize on opportunities when they arise. And there is an opportunity right now with electric vehicles uh, in that an electric car, a Tesla or a Hyundai um, next to a petrol Corolla at the traffic lights, one of those cars is paying to use the road at the point of use, the, the, the petrol car, but the other two aren't. They're not paying to use the roads. Um, and if you cast forward 20 years when most new vehicles sold will be electric, um, very few people will be paying to use the roads. If you make anything free, it will be consumed and over-consumed. There won't be a revenue stream to maintain existing roads and build new ones. But we can solve that problem now by just putting an equivalent rate uh, on electric vehicles, it's equivalent to fuel excise. So nobody pays twice, everybody pays once, everybody pays their fair share. So previously you would, uh, I guess that perfect model would be trying to solve a bunch of different problems, including the revenue problem, but also congestion and maybe uh, the impact that heavier vehicles have. And in this report, you're, uh, it, there's an opportunity you've identified to solve purely the revenue problem without uh, necessarily making a, a substantial changes to other stakeholders. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, there's nothing about the proposal we're saying that precludes doing those things later on, nor does it presuppose that one would do those things later on. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still see a future where with a, a distance-based charge in place, um, that one would be able to add layers to that to achieve different policy outcomes. But in the first instance, there is just a uh, there's a fairness issue that, that some people are paying a fuel excise and some people through their ownership of an electric vehicle aren't making a contribution. That's something we can correct, correct really quite easily. It doesn't, nobody needs to know where the electric vehicle driver has been or what speed they were going or when they went there. Just a simple odometer reading that applies a charge that is equal and equivalent to fuel excise means that both of those cars next to each other, the petrol one and the electric one, were making a fair and equal contribution to the upkeep of the roads. How That's do you it. calculate what is the equivalent to excise if there's such high degrees of variation in efficiency for existing internal combustion engine vehicles? Yeah, so you, you have to use averages. Um, so if you look over the past 12 years, the average has been about six cents a kilometre 
Um, so the the average car driving the average kilometers, you do that by calculating the total amount of kilometers and then the total amount of fuel excise and and doing a bit of arithmetic. So yeah, you know it it is the average car traveling the average kilometers does pay this amount per kilometer. Um, it's six cents over the last twelve years. Right now, it's about four cents a kilometer. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's declined quite rapidly over that time, and it will decline further. You have to pick a number for this. Yeah. We used four cents a kilometer because that's the the current rate. That there's other options, and in theory, that should stabilize the revenue loss over the foreseeable future. Yeah, um, again, it depends on the, the rate you pick. But if you assume that every uh, electric vehicle kilometer travelled in the future is replacing a petrol kilometer or a diesel kilometer that's not travelled, uh, if you're recovering the same average rate from both, you should arrest the decline in fuel excise or general revenue from it. The other thing it allows you to do is capture the additional kilometers travelled. Mm-hmm. So the, the decline in fuel excise per kilometer is driven by two things. One is declining fuel consumption because cars have become more efficient, but also a fairly dramatic increase in the number of kilometers traveled. So over the timeframes I spoke about, the fuel excise revenue has gone down by 20% and vehicle kilometers has gone up by 30%. So we've got this increasing demand and declining revenue. Like, you know, you want those two lines on a graph going in the same direction. Absolutely. I'm just in my head, I'm imagining a couple of, uh, to play devil's advocate, imagining a couple of potential workarounds here. What if a hybrid vehicle um, spends, you know, 10% of its kilometers um, driving on pure electric um, or, and, and there's a whole variety of, of, of proportions there that they, that some of these hybrid vehicles have. Some of them are even plug-in hybrids and they can spend just the majority of their time driving all electric. How does your proposal deal with them? Uh, so these are all within government's gift to set where these policy parameters lie. The proposal we have said is you take the most efficient hybrid or plug-in hybrid vehicle available today, which is uh, uses one litre per 100 kilometres on the, the officially rated mm-hmm. level of um, fuel consumption. You say anything that, that is more efficient than that would fall under the new regime mm-hmm. because they're not using much um, fuel anyway and they're capable of being driven without using full fuel, particularly if they're a plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So we're saying you take the baseline of the best available today and you say anything new in the market that falls under that would fall under the new regime because you don't want to create a perverse incentive where an ultra hybrid is selected because it yeah. avoids it, exactly. in effect both systems. So uh, again, it's a bit... Um, There's a grey area. It's a grey area where it's the fringes, but it's a relatively small area of the fringes. And if you talk to the technology people on this, they'll say that hybrids look like a transitional technology. It doesn't make a lot of sense to carry around both types of kit Mm. in a car uh, and they see those as being a transitional technology between the internal combustion engine world that we're in now and the electric future that we're moving towards. I think it'll be very interesting to see how governments react to it, particularly as the federal government's budget projects significant erosion in their tax base. I think we've discussed it before on this show with, from memory with Scott Charlton of whether or not this is a sort of a burning platform issue or is it more of a frog in boiling water issue? Um, and I guess this is how they react to your work will really be an indication of which one of those it is. So it's a great piece of work by IPA, and I encourage listeners to go to the Infrastructure Partnerships Australia website to see it in further detail.